Perfect. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, welcome to the afternoon session of the workshop. I'm Carla Chiesterini, and we have uh, four talks uh, this afternoon. The first one is by Hank Wimmersch. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry, we are the last name of, of Hank uh, during lunch. From uh, Chalmers University, he's a professor uh, in uh, communication systems with the Department of Electrical Engineering. And uh, he leads the area of cooperative systems. He's affiliated also with the Force Research Center on Optical Communication. He's an author uh, of iterative research, receiver design, and uh, his uh, research interests are on algorithm design for digital communication, localization, and statistical uh, inference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. All right. Again, apologies for being a bit late. We had a very nice lunch, which caused some minor delays. So, uh, good afternoon. This talk, I guess, is kind of closely related to what Falco was talking about in the morning. So, there's no stochastic geometry. There will be a few equations. So, please do your best to stay awake after lunch. Um, so, this talk is about positioning. And this is a picture from a colleague of mine in uh, UAB, Barcelona who talks about what will 6G bring for positioning. He made a similar slide for 5G a few years ago. And actually, what, what, what is now 6G, he actually put 5G, but then he realized we were not going to make it, so now he put 6G. But anyway, so what you see in this slide is that there's different wireless communication systems. There's also GNSS. They have different uncertainty levels and different deployment regimes. And, and the vision for 5G was to work in this indoor regime and also urban outdoors where GPS is often denied to provide meter level accuracy. And, and this can be achieved on, under some conditions. And then for 6G, the goal is to all, go all the, down all the way to about a centimeter. And the purpose of this talk is to try to understand how this is possible and what are the technologies to do that. So the outline for today's talk will be as follows. So I'll first uh, talk a little bit about the foundations of radio localization and sensing. I assume many people here are not aware of this, so just kind of small tutorial. Then I'll talk about how localization works in 5G, both how it's done in, in standardization and done in practice, as well as potential things that we could do with current 5G technologies without any kind of severe modifications. And then I talk about uh, the integration of sensing, localization, and communication uh, towards 6G. I call it here ice like just to give it a name. And, and in, in many of these um, parts, there will be some emphasis on vehicular systems, but positioning, of course, can be done for any kind of connected device. And then I will end with a few research questions and challenges. So first of all, the foundation. Okay, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. So I should only be speaking. All right, so the main principle of radio-based positioning is that a radio waveform tells you something about geometry. And these first pictures is something from my course at Chalmers on wireless communication. So there's a, a transmitting source here sending a signal to a destination over a complex propagation environment. And if you have sufficient bandwidth at the receiver side, you will see something like this picture on the right. Mm -hmm. So you see here as a function of time, the received signal amplitude, and you see a first arriving path, maybe the line of sight path, and then other, other multipath components coming later. All right. And each of these multipath components, they have to do something with geometry. And geometry is what we use to do positioning. Of course, practical communication systems, they would not give you something like this because they wouldn't have the bandwidth available, the processing capabilities available. There are other kinds of measurements that you could have, for instance, received signal strength, or you could do time-based measurements, you could do angle-based measurements, and then you combine those measurements to come up with a position estimate. And position estimated, estimation is a kind of statistical estimation problem, which means that we can use all the tools from statistical estimation theory to solve it. And for, for instance, what we do in our group is we work for instance, on Fisher information analysis to understand what is the best achievable performance under this condition. Um, we also work on algorithms, of course, how to do the positioning. And a lot of these algorithms, uh, they, they convert to kind of non-convex optimization problems. You cannot do traditional convex optimization theory, but typically we use a combination of geometric methods, combine them with maximum likelihood, convexification. And of course, since position, position is something that changes over time, we're doing tracking, Kalman filtering, particle filtering, and so forth. Um, using the same technique of fresh information theory, we also do signal design. So we optimize the signals that are for instance, being sent by a base station to help a vehicle or user be localized as well as possible. And we'll talk about that more later. 
And then in positioning, we must deal with all kind of practical aspects that maybe you don't think about for communication. So for instance, we need very fine synchronization between base stations. The reason we need fine synchronization is when you do time-based measurements, and you have a delay difference of one nanoseconds, you're 30 centimeters off, right? So nanoseconds count in our case, much less critical for communication. We must deal also with hardware limitations, calibration. For instance, if you put a base station there, we need to know where it is, how it's tilted and so forth to do the positioning. Over the years, I've been working on position now for many, many years, and it's always been a kind of very small field, but now it's, it's really growing very, very rapidly because of the integration of sensing and communication. The nice thing is over the past 20 years, whatever people came up with for communication, we said, oh, this is very cool for localization. Massive MIMO, millimeter wave, device to device communication, all these things that people from communication come up with, we just kind of reuse and then modify it to be used for positioning. And we'll talk about a few of those later today. Um, I, I want to clarify a little bit of terminology because I think it's good to have a little bit of tutorial. So when I talk about positioning, this is a term used in 3GPP in wireless communication. And this means the, the estimation of the 3D position of a connected device, like a UE, a user equipment. There's also localization, which is a term used more in robotics, which refers to estimating the 6D pose of a robot. And 6D corresponds to 3D position and 3D orientation. Um, in wireless communication, we use both. So I think when I talk about localization or positioning, I mean the same thing. There's also sensing. So sensing has been used a lot now, integrated sensing and communication, I think often misused. So strictly speaking, sensing is detection of uh, events or changes in environment, but often it's used in wireless communication to mean radar type sensing, right? To figure out the presence of objects or targets and then to estimate their position and track their position over time. Talking about positioning, um, there's two kinds of positioning that I want to point out. One is snapshot positioning. So this is what 3GPP provides you. You have signals coming down from the base station, for instance, and then from that, the user can estimate its position, and then it will move, and it will forget about where it was, and it does this process again. So that's snapshot-based positioning that you can do many times. There's also tracking, where the user is using knowledge of its own dynamics. How is it moving? For instance, the, the wheels, how many times are they turning? to then fuse with measurements from base stations to improve localization. This is called tracking. So this is just a kind of terminology that I will use and I think it's good to bear in mind during this talk. All right, so let's look at the different kind of measurements first. The most obvious thing to think about is signal strength, right? When you're further away from a base station, the signal strength is less. So in principle, you could map the received signal strength back to a distance. In practice, this doesn't work at all because there's so much variation of received signal strength, you would have very, very poor measurements in terms of the distance. And this is why received signal strength is in practice only used for localization using fingerprints, which means that a device would measure to receive signal strength from a large variety of access points, for instance, Wi-Fi access points, and it looks in the database and see, okay, which locations correspond to this fingerprint of received signal strength and then positions itself, but never the inversion of path loss. So again, good to know. The most common way of doing positioning is using time-based measurements. So in this case, you would have, for instance, a base station sending a signal to a user. The base station and user are generally not synchronized. So this I, I depict by having different clocks. Yeah, so the base station is sending in its own clock reference and the user sending in its own clock reference. So the, the, the time of arrival measured of the signal at the user side is, of course, depends on the distance over the speed of light, plus the clock bias of the user. Right. And this clock bias is something unknown that you must estimate together with the position. And this is also how GPS works. So in GPS, you typically need four satellites in view. You need three for position and one for the clock bias. And then for the mathematically inclined, I put some equations of, of how we would um, do this. So we would, for instance, have an OFDM signal where we send pilots over different subcarriers. At the receiver in the line of sight case, we would have over subcarrier and channel gain the pilot, and then over the subcarriers an increasing phase depending on the delay, right? And then applying an FFT, we can look at the peak and we figure out what else does our delay. Relatively straightforward. Another kind of measurement is angle-based measurements, and there's two kinds of measurements. One is angle of arrival, angle of departure. So angle of arrival, you can think of the following. Um, you are Francois is a user. I'm gonna pick on you today. You're a user, single antenna sending a signal to me, I have an array of antennas. And then by looking at the phase across the signal, the phase of the signal across these antennas, I can figure out what is the angle from in my frame of reference towards Francois. Okay. That's angle of arrival, very commonly used. There's something a little bit less intuitive, which is angle of departure, okay. it's shown on the right. Now you have to imagine I'm a base station, I have many antennas. 
Francois, a single antenna user. And I want Francois to estimate the angle of departure from me to him with his single antenna. And not very obvious that you can do that, right? So this is some mathematics, but the one way of thinking about this is as follows. So we agree beforehand that I am going to send directional beams, 180 directional beams, indexed from one to 180. And Francois will measure received signals, right? And we start one, two, mm -hmm. three. And at some point, there will, beam with high, there will be a beam with high received signal strength. And I continue. And then just by the beam index, Francois will know the angle of departure from him, from me to him. Okay. So this is how angle of departure works. And all of these are used right now in, in 5G systems. So I, I suppose that you would exactly set one base station to do some triangulation? Yes. Yeah, but one base station, in principle, you, you know that you're on a line. And if you have two bases at this intersection of two lines, you could localize yourself, correct? Okay, and then you can put it together exactly what you're asking. So you could have different um, delay-based measurements. So if you can compute um, time of arrival measurements with respect to three base stations, then in principle, you could figure out your, three, your 2D position. I remember the user here is not synchronized to the base station, so you cannot form circles around the base station, but instead, you have hyperbola around base stations from something called time difference of arrival measurements. If the user was synchronized to the base stations, then the time of arrival would give you a distance, and then you know you're on the intersection of circles, and that gives you your position. You could also combine this with angle based measurements. So if you have angle of departure from several bases, you could be localized through an intersections of lines on any combination of those measurements. Right? And all of these problems, they have the same kind of structure. So you have some observation of Y, which could be a vector of angles and delays that you measure. And then there's something unknown X, and in this case, X is the position typically, and some mapping from position to measurements. And you need to invert this mapping, and this you can do using least squares, maximum likelihood, whatever is your favorite criteria. Um, okay, I'm sorry, this is a bit small font, but I think it's good to talk a little bit about kind of the performance metrics that we use for positioning. So we don't care about rate because we're not communicating anything. We care not very much about SNR because we're only sending pilots typically. So we can integrate over time across subcares, across antenna. We can boost our SNR a lot, but we care about other things. So we care for instance about resolution. And um, I can, many people have some idea what this, what this means resolution, but I just want to make it a bit more precise. So resolution refers to the ability to separate signal paths. Okay, so if I have a radar and I send a signal and then I am here, you are two reflectors. These signals are coming at roughly the same delay. So they're not resolvable. But if I have lots and lots of bandwidth, even a small difference in delay, I can make the paths resolvable. Okay. Once they are resolvable, you can talk about accuracy. Okay. This tells me how well can I estimate the parameters of one path separately. And accuracy could be, for instance, in delay accuracy, it could be angle accuracy, could also then be turned into position accuracy. Um, accuracy and pre precision, if you look at the textbook, they mean something different, but in positioning, we are kind of wild west, we don't care, we call all of it accuracy. Okay. And now you can think of accuracy as saying, okay, I can be localized within a five meter uncertainty range 99.9% .9 of the time, that would be an accuracy measure. Um, also, we care about latency, right? we want our position estimates quick, because otherwise the user will have moved too far and it's no longer useful. And in some safety critical cases, we also care about integrity. And this is, for instance, um, what we need to promise that the user uncertainty is within some range a certain fraction of the time. And this fraction is like 99 and a bunch of nines after that. Okay, it's important, for instance, for autonomous driving. And, and this picture is kind of showing these different uh, accuracy, precision, and resolution. Okay. Um, and this is a, a slide I prepared mainly for in my class because. People have a hard time to understand what is the difference between resolution and accuracy. So I will just briefly go through this. So you have to imagine that there's a car with a radar, and for whatever reason, it's, it's, there's five these lampposts in front of it <laughs> artificially, and they're 20 meters separated. Okay, and then with this radar, it should try to figure out how many lampposts there are and what is their distances. Okay. Or at least it should figure out what is the, the distance of the first lamppost. And what I show here is on a, as a function of bandwidth. <laughs> the RMSE of the first path. So the RMSE of determining the distance to the first lamppost. Okay. And on the y-axis, on the figure on the right, I show on the x-axis bandwidth, and on the y-axis, the number of paths that are detected by the, the radar algorithm. Okay. And this is kind of using orthogonal matching for stupid compressive sampling. Right? And what you see is when the bandwidth is small, you only see one path. 
even though there are five lampposts, I cannot, the, the radar cannot resolve them. They look like one kind of blurred lamppost. But when the, result, when the band gets larger and larger, they become separable. Okay. And at some point, oops, I see, okay, there are five lampposts and with more bandwidth, I'm not going to see more lampposts. Okay, but there, there's this kind of threshold phenomenon that you have here. On this figure, I show um, in this yellow curve, the resolution. So with more bandwidth, I have a fundamental resolution. I can separate multipath. When you talk to radar people, they say, okay, resolution is what I care about. Um, I cannot do better than resolution, but that's not true. You can do much, much better than resolution. And this is what these figures on the bottom show. So this horizontal line is the interpad distance, 20 meter. And at some point, the interpad distance crosses the resolution. Okay, so the resolution becomes better than the interpad distance. Before this crossing point, this blue curve shows how well can I estimate the first path. And basically I cannot estimate the first path really well at all just because the paths are blurred together. But at some point when my bandwidth is large enough, this curve drops down and I can do way better than the resolution. And I'm just limited by SNR. And I can bring this down to millimeter level if I want to, but just boosting the SNR. So just because you have a certain bandwidth doesn't mean you, can do, you cannot do very accurate position. You just need to have resolvability of multipath through bandwidth or through large antenna arrays. And then you can go as, as far down as you want. All right, so this is the foundations. And I think what I tell you here, I, I think yeah, this really provides you kind of a good knowledge of what, what is positioning all about, what are the important metrics. So now let's go on to how things are done in 5G. Oh, question, sorry. So got to, you alluded to uh, maximum likelihood and uh, when you combine all this uh, information, but don't you have also prior information on the location of users that are along streets with uh, in likely way? Yes. Can, can we use Bayesian methods? Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. A lot of these things are Bayesian tracking methods, particles. For, yes, of course. I just show kind of right. non-Bayesian to, to make things a bit easier to understand. All right, so what happens in 5G? So in 5G, we use typically time difference of arrival. So I think now you know a little bit about this already, but there's here a user broadcasting a signal, in this case, uplink to several base stations. These base stations are perfectly synchronized. And again, perfectly, you should think about nanosecond level synchronization. At base station I, the signal comes a little bit delayed there. And then base station I can compute the time of arrival measurements. What we saw is the distance between the user and the I base station over speed of light plus the clock bias of the user plus mod. And this clock bias is common to all of the base stations. So we can compute this differential measurements, saying base station zero is the reference. And then the clock bias is gone in this expression. And each of these differential measurements determines a hyperbola. Right. And this is what is shown on the figure on the right. So there's these three base stations. And from three base stations, you can compute two hyperbola and the users on the intersection of those hyperbola. These hyperbola are a bit blurred. And they are blurred just because of limited resolution. Right? You have a kind of large uncertainty region just because you cannot estimate the delays very well. So things become blurred. So this is why having more bandwidth would be really, really helpful because this allows me to separate paths in the delay domain. Um, since release 16 in 3GPP, there's been some enhancements to the positioning procedures, also to the kind of signals that are being used. So they use this so-called comb signals that are using the whole frequency band over time. They also use um, beams to use angle of departure measurement. This is exactly what I said before. Different beams in different directions. The user just measures the signal strength and then can use this to localize itself in combination with the delay measurements. Um, yeah, lots of enhancements, different kind of positioning signals, coherent combining. Um, and the outcome of this is that in principle, submeter localization accuracy is possible, but only if the base stations are really well synchronized. And if you have a lot of base stations around and the environment is not too complicated, not too cluttered. So there's lots of caveats there. Um, timing synchronization is of course a major bottleneck. It's not easy to get this nanosecond synchronization. And most base stations, although they could have a large number of antenna elements, the angle resolution, meaning the kind of the width of these beams is still quite limited for a positioning application. So it's not very useful yet. So this is kind of still ongoing work. Within 3GPP, um, you could still do things that are not being done right now. So one of them is so-called multipath exploitation. Okay, so this is a way where you would localize with a single base station, so that you don't need to worry about synchronization, you don't need to have advanced deployment, but you would localize a user with a single base station by using the ambient environment. Okay. So what I have here is a base station sending a downlink signal to the user, and green is the line of sight path. That's the one that we think usually, this is the path that we care about for position. 
But there's also paths going here to, to a wall and hitting the user, and maybe a small object and hitting the user. And if both the base station and the user have antenna arrays, all of these paths can bring information. And the reason is just kind of a counting argument. So each path has an incidence point right on the wall, let's say. This incidence point has three degrees of freedom, x, y, z coordinates. But each path brings also a certain number of observables, measurements. One is a delay, right, which tells you something about distance up to clock bias, but it's also angles. And there's actually four angles. There's the angles of departure from the base station in azimuth and elevation, if the base station has an array. As you can measure an angle in this way, and you can measure an angle in this way. Same for the user, you can measure angles in azimuth and elevation. So each path brings five measurements and three unknowns. So this is really good. So each path, if it can be resolved, again, it needs to be resolved. If it can be resolved, it brings information. And then it turns out if you have a line of sight and one resolved incidence point, in principle, that's enough to solve the localization problem. Just because you have enough observables. I mean, it requires some kind of more sophisticated processing than traditionally done, but it's possible. So this means with a single base station and one kind of strong enough reflector that's resolvable, you can localize the user, you can synchronize the user to the base station, you can figure out the orientation of the user, and you can figure out where the incidence point is. You can map the environment. And I think that's, that's really amazing just with a single base station. Question. Do you need to know a model of the environment or even without knowing anything about the environment? It, it, there needs to be an incidence point. So it should be kind of a nice specular reflection or a small scatter point. If it's a very diffuse scattering with kind of lots of paths adding up, then it will not work as well. Yeah, so it should be kind of point source. Yeah, but uh, related to this question, so if you know the if you know where the car is you get, get an idea of the environment yeah it, it isn't uh, yeah. Uh, it's a sort of chicken and egg yes this is called a slam problem simultaneous localization and mapping okay so yes exactly okay. so we kind of switch on our vehicle we have a vague notion of where we are and as we move in the environment we're figuring out better and better where we are at the same time map the environment and use this map information to improve our position okay. so this is exactly what we do but it's a non-conventional slam, slam problem i don't want to go into the details now and there's some papers here to talk about this but okay we kind of resolve this deployment issue we just can do with one base station and the synchronization problem is somehow solved by nature right you don't need to worry that this incident point is synchronized to the base station nature has taken care of that for you um let's get this yeah maybe this is kind of just a short movie of a user moving around the base station building up a map of the environment and at the same time trying to localize itself and maybe this is interesting to know so in terms of methodologies there's many methods to do slam the one that we're using, which I think is mathematically kind of interesting, is something called random finite set theory. So it's a theory of, of rather than having random vectors as we're used to, a random sets. So there's a probability that the set is empty, there's a probability that the set has one element with a certain density, two elements with a certain density, and so forth. It is very natural for solving this kind of problem because well, you, you don't know how many sources are in the environment, how many objects there are, you do not know the ordering of the measurements, so how each measurement maps to each source. Right, is, is a certain measurement of angles and delays for from the line of sight path, or this wall that I've seen before, or is it a new wall? Mm -hmm. And then this is kind of automatically dealt with through this random finite set methodology. Okay, another potential, something that you then you could do with 5G right now is to have per user signal optimization. So how positioning works right now is a base station would broadcast a signal to everyone, this time frequency pattern, maybe in combination with these beams, but it doesn't care whether a user is there or not. Right? But if I know Francois is there, why don't I just, and Francois really cares about where he is, right? I really want to localize him very well. I could design an optimized signal just for him. He's a VIP user and I optimize a, a pilot signal just for him. And this optimization can be done in time and frequency. If I know how far away he is, for instance, or I know how quickly he's moving and also in the angle domain. And then you can come up with kind of very strange looking beams Right, which you would never use for communication, but they're very good for position. So, and it turns out, for instance, if, if, if I know Francois is more or less there, if I want to communicate to him, I would generate a directional beam to him, obviously, highest SNR. If I want to localize Francois, I would not do that at all. I would send first a directional beam with some power, and then later I would send a beam which has a null in your direction. And the combination of the two is what you would use for position. And we can talk if we have time maybe more about why this is. But anyway, my point is you can design 
positioning signals for users, group of users that will really boost their performance. So you can have a differentiated, differentiated server level, and this could be done now already. And then finally, what you could also do is, of course, is sensing. And here I think in terms of radar-like sensing, where a base station or a user device, right, could emit a signal. And you, I think of here, for instance, a user sending an OFDM signal to a base station uplink, but at the same time, looking at the backscattered signal, processing this to figure out where are the objects in the environment. Um, a main bottleneck here, although there's a lot of research in this, is uh, the full duplex operation, which people I think don't really understand sufficiently because full duplex has been around for communication a long time, right? But for communication, the interference suppression that you need to have is on the order of, let's say, 50 dB. But when you want to do radar, you have to go to 100 dB, 150 dB, just because the backscatter signal is so, so weak. So it's really very problematic to do radar monostatic sensing with OFDM. And maybe it's better to use a dedicated waveform. But supposing that you could do this, then you can play all kinds of neat tricks, right? So this print is a figure showing a radar transmitter. And let's say I want to communicate to Martin, right? But at the same time, I want to sense the environment. What kind of power allocation should I use? If I want to communicate to Martin, I would only do water filling, right? There's an application file, I do water filling. But maybe that's very bad for radar. If I only care about radar, I would you know, maybe ignore Martin and just do beams all over the place and a uniform power allocation. And then there's a kind of creative optimal frontier that you can move around with different power allocations having different performances. So on the x-axis is a communication metric where higher is better. On the y-axis is a radar metric where lower is better. And you could walk around with this frontier. So in principle, it can be done, but I think there's lots of really practical challenges to do this. All right, so this is what is done in 5G or what could be done in 5G. Now let's look a little bit forward towards 6G. Um, so what is happening in 6G? And this is basically my understanding from the EU projects that were involved in. So Chalmers is involved with this HexaX flagship project, which aims to define a vision for 6G in Europe. So one of the things that is happening is that we go to higher carrier frequencies. So we'll have a variety of carriers below 6 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz, and probably also something in D-band just to support these extreme data rates that are required. Uh, we will need large aggregates bandwidths, and this large bandwidth is really, that's why we're moving to these high carriers. So above one gigahertz of bandwidth will be not unthinkable. Now, when we go to these higher carriers, the path loss will be significant, right? So then we need to combat this with a large enough antenna aperture. So we'll have very large arrays, maybe 10 by 10, 20 by 20, 30 by 30 arrays. We'll have side links. Now, side link has been a touchy topic that's been on and off in standardization. Now it's back again for, I think, release 18 discussions. Um, so maybe side link will be back. So side link is the link between vehicles, probably in the control of the base station. And this is what could allow for kind of cooperative perception, sharing of information directly, and also radar. Natural densification, potentially many more access points, although I said maybe we don't need so many for positioning, but we will have a lot of natural access points. Integration of sensing, localization, communication. Um, here in the sense that when you want to do communication at these very high frequencies and you need to do directional transmission, the channel is kind of geometric, right? If I want to communicate with you, I'm going to point a beam towards you. So if I know where you are, very helpful for communication. Um, again, something maybe debatable. AI is now a very hot topic. People are saying it will be used all over the place. I don't think it will be used all over the place, but I think there are certain kind of niche problems where it could really shine. Um, shaping the environment with intelligent surfaces, these reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. Again, a debatable topic, but still worth exploring. Um, so these are the kind of eight positives. And then there's a few challenges that I want to point out. So hardware impairments, which mm -hmm. I think will be much more severe for localization and sensing than for communication. And um, yeah, the fact that when you have extreme performance, right, when you want to localize something with one centimeter accuracy, you need extreme calibration far beyond what anybody has done before. Right? A small error in the tilt of a base station of, of a fraction of the degree can lead to very large positioning errors. And it's not obvious that uh, people are willing to do this. So I'm not gonna talk about all of these. I will just talk about these four bullets here. So integration of sensing, communication, localization, widespread use of AI, intelligent surfaces, and hardware impairments. Just one slide each before I will wrap up. All right, so the integration of sensing, localization, and communication. Already we talked a little bit about this. Um, it's becoming a very hot topic. There's now even a special, there's a technical initiative at IEEE, which is very visible, very active. 
there's several initiatives happening across the world to support this. Um, I think in the next European call for this SNS project, joint communication sensing is one of the, the main topics there. Um, there's many people using different terminologies. It's a real alphabet soup. So there's, there was there used to be joint radar communication, then there's dual functioning radar communication, ICAS integrated communication sensing, ISAC integrated sensing communication, ISLAC. So I don't know which is the one that will stick, but I think ISAC is the one that is most uh, most common now. And I like it because it says integrated rather than joint. When you say joint communication and sensing, it gives the impression that you're sending the same waveform that will use, be used for communication, also for sensing. When it's integrated, somehow much broader, right? It could be that I have a sensing waveform and from the back scattered signal, I know where you are and then I use it for communication. So it seems a kind of more honest way of doing this. Um, yeah, lots of research going on in terms of waveforms now towards 6G. Probably OFDM in its standard form will not be used. Um, we'll, we'll probably not use something like people are doing in radar, like frequency modulated continuous wave. It's very bad for sending communication data, but something in between. Okay, and I think that the key, the top candidate right now is DFT spread OFDM. Although some universities, in particular TU Dresden, they are pushing other waveforms, um, but it's still up in the air. Several bottlenecks to make this happen, as I mentioned. So OFDM may not be the best candidate because of PAPR issues. So peak to average power ratio issues. And also the fact that um, the full duplex operation with OFDM is, is not very good. Severe hardware limitations, which I will talk about in a little minute. Um, yeah, we need to have new KPIs rather than just the standard accuracy and resolution. Issues related to spectrum, is it just shared spectrum, which operator owns it, how do we control the links, and then of course, interference detection mitigation. Uh, because now we have all these services coexisting with different demands, different prioritization. It's not, not obvious how those will be solved. So I, I don't provide any answers. It's more questions and just highlighting that this is something that is coming and how it relates to what we talked about today. Widespread use of AI and ML. Um, so I, I think one use of, of, one interesting use of AI and ML is for dealing with hardware impairment mitigations. In my group, we've been using AI basically mainly for optical communications because in optical communication, it's really hard to have models for the different components in an optical transmitter and a receiver. And when you have a concatenation of lots of nonlinear, noisy, and linear impairments all concatenated, you have no way of doing a maximum likelihood receiver. And for that reason, we're doing typically end to end learning for learning an optimal transmitter and optimal receiver over such a complicated fiber channel. When we move in wireless communication to D band, I think the same thing will happen. Will be so limited by hardware, which is maybe at the component level possible to model, but combined not. And then maybe AI uh, could be a solution. And, and this is an example of work that we are uh, we submitted to ICC, where we have, a, and I will not, I don't have time to go through all the details, but there's an auto encoder for a joint communication system where there's an encoder system and a decoder system, which we train end to end to, to have a flexible trade off between communication and sensing. And this trade-off is shown for the sticker here. So the x-axis is a radar metric, the detection probability, so higher is better. The probability that I can detect the target on the y-axis, symbol error rate, so lower is better. Okay. And by then, by providing this whole autoencoder with a single parameter, how much do I care about communication versus sensing? Again, I move up on this kind of create the optimal frontier. And okay, the, the last trick is not very exciting. It just shows that this end-to-end -end learning can do pretty much as good as a model-based baseline. Right? But okay, why do we care? We care because for instance, when we introduce hardware impairments, so for instance, this is a case where the antenna spacing, so the spacing within element is not exactly lambda over two, but perturbed with a very, very small amount, then you see that this baseline is starting to fail. Well, the autoencoder, which went from end to end data in principle can still cope with this. Um, yeah, this is just an example. I, I don't have time to go to do a whole talk on AI right now, but so, Problems for which model-based methods completely fail, I think is a good area for applying AI. With two more topics. So another kind of really hot topic is intelligent meta surfaces or reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. So these comprise lots of small elements that can be controlled. Yeah, you can think of these are having a kind of phase control and the space control can then be used to, when the signal's coming in in some direction to kind of redirect it to an arbitrary direction. So it, it creates a kind of non-natural reflection, you can think of this, okay? And you can just control this, uh, but other than that, it's passive. So it doesn't have any amplifiers, it doesn't amplify the signal, it just redirects and can, it can focus it in some direction. 
And the typical use is in communication when you have a source and a destination and the line of sight is blocked. Now you put this big surface on the wall, you can create a focused beam towards the destination and overcome blockages. Okay. And again, this is a typical example where communication people come up with something and we say, okay, let's see what we can do for positioning. And obviously we can think about doing position under line of sight blockage. So when one base station is blocked by a building, but these intelligent services are there, you can have signal paths and you can estimate angles and delays from those signal paths to localize the user. When this intelligent service is large, you can use this, uh, you can use wavefront curvature to localize. So even without line of sight to base station, so just using the curvature of the wavefront and this provides good information for localization. Again, if you want more, there's a reference there. <coughs> and yeah, all of these, I think, are just kind of now big research fields by themselves. The last one is hardware impairment mitigations. Um, so the, the figure here on the equation on the top shows the kind of vanilla millimeter wave channel model where XTK is like a, OF, like a QAM symbol at time, t on a, at time t on a certain subcarrier K. VT is a precoder, let's say at the base station towards the user. HK is the multipath propagation channel over subcarrier K. And UT is a combiner at the user, right? And then N is noise. And then this channel is just with many paths, with gains, angles of arrival, angle of departure, steering vectors, and then a linear increase of phase according to the delay. If you haven't seen this before, you just have to believe me. If you open any millimeter wave paper, this is the kind of basic model. Now, this is without any hardware impairments. When you think about what kind of hardware impairments could be introduced, there's a variety of them. So you could have mutual coupling, so between the antenna elements, this would be coupling matrices of transmitter and receiver. You would have power amplifier nonlinearity, right, which is source of signal and amplitude and phase. You could have in-phase and quadrature imbalance. You could have um, intercarrier interference due to phase noise. You could have quantization noise. There's definitely not an exhaustive list of hardware impairments. It just shows that you know, the model becomes much more complicated. And when you're a communication person, all you care about is this age, right? And you don't care that this H actually has this very nasty form. There's just an H in between. When you estimate it, you're done. But me, as a localization person, I think about, okay, I care about these angles and these delays that are hidden inside of here. So I need to care about all these impairments and understand how much do they affect the positioning quality. And for that reason, I really think that hardware impairments for positioning, for sensing will be a very important future topic of research. And then our, our approach is kind of threefold. So First, we stick our head in the sand, we ignore and see what happens, kind of analyze what is the impact. If we see that there's a big penalty due to a hardware impairment, we look at novel mitigation methods. And in some extreme cases, you can even exploit the hardware impairment mitigations. And it's not very obvious that you can do this. Um, we've only found two cases. One is intercarrier interference, as you can exploit this in monostatic radar. The other one is phase noise. You can also exploit in monostatic radar. And why this is, we can talk about this offline if you want, but there are a few kind of corner cases where hardware impairments can help you. All right, so where is this? Let's wrap this up. What's coming? How is this coming together? So the future will be a combination of communication with more bandwidth, more antennas, the use of AI for solving certain problems, including radar and sensing. I separate them here because sensing can mean many things. You could be Kind of material recognition, weather monitoring, pollution monitoring, localization, adapting the environment through intelligent surface, all of this brings together into this kind of combined ecosystem. We, we wrote a paper a few years ago, initiated from the University of Oulu, and they have this 6G flagship program, a white paper on localization and sensing in 6G, which was the vision then, now it's two years ago. I think we've, we've become a bit more realistic, more our feet are on the ground, so some of the things are really no longer true. But if you want to know more, I think the HexaX and Rice CG project are a good place to start to understand how we are working with localization sensing towards 6G. All right, so let me wrap up. Um, I hope now that you, you realize that radio signals provide information for localization. Right? This is true for GPS, Wi-Fi, or 5G. The regime of high frequencies with large bandwidths and many antennas is very interesting. It's also the regime where, for instance, radar would operate. In 5G, and again, I hope you now understand this. In principle, it's possible to do single base station positioning, synchronization, mapping, and orientation estimation using the propagation environment. So you turn the propagation environment from foe to friend. 
Beyond 5G, uh, intelligent surface could bring a new technology towards localization, new measurements, new infrastructure. Um, there will be probably be flexible requirements, many different use cases that need to be supported. So we'll probably have to design these tailor-made signals to the VIP users to make sure that they have the good positioning quality. Um, we will operate with similar parameters as automotive radar, similar frequencies. There are opportunities there to collaborate, right? There's opportunities for 6G to replace automotive radar, but of course there's lots of resistance from the incumbents there. Um, hardware limitations, I believe, will be very important for localization and sensing much more so than for communication. Uh, Sidelink will appear again, an interesting question. And I think we have a lot to learn from other fields. Uh, in GNSS, they've been working on this for decades, right? They know how to do carrier phase positioning, they know how to do integrity, and we should really learn from them and not reinvent the wheel. Um, and in summary, I, I think it's a very exciting time to be working in this field. I've been doing radio-based positioning since my postdoc at MIT in 2005, but really now, the last two, three years has been the start of the golden age of positioning and sensing. So, thank you. Questions from the audience in the room? Um, in, in SIG, I heard about, about from physicists about this uh, focal spot uh, thing that they have in mind for CG, right? For the facing beams, right? You need a, a spot mm -hmm. in the middle. So, um, how is it incorporated in your? So, you need for that a, a good positioning, yes, uh, of course, yes. And so, this, this is what you call the uh, and you have the iterative procedure. The integration you, of communication right, sensing. Right. Yes, yes, okay. exactly. So you yes. would do that, and, yes. uh, and on the basis of, of uh, a sort of iterative scheme, yes. you, you could organize a focal spot on that user yes. and even follow it using. Yeah, 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 exactly. But it's an iterative procedure because at the beginning you know nothing, and then you need to learn, and then you okay. the user is more or less there. I refine, and then till I'm happy enough, and then I send this high energy yeah. communication signal to that user. Yeah. But certainly, you need very big arrays of antennas. Yes. Uh, I mean, systems of elements of antennas. To yes. And yes. Exactly. But this is people, what people. Com computation, I don't know, but at least uh, you need a large array. I think computationally, I, I don't think that's the main bottleneck here. Yeah. Yeah. It's maybe to control all of the all of the elements in these arrays to actually coherently combine okay. to the user. There's some hardware limitations, but computation-wise, I don't okay. see a big issue. But, yeah. but exactly. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I, I believe from uh, some experience very far away from now uh, on radar, there was a lot of uh, uh, work uh, related to FMC, right? So you need to have this transformation from like a, a bandwidth and delays to Caucasian, uh, etc. So, uh, and I, I, I recently heard a new talk about how AI, for example, can are trying to accelerate, let's say, uh, possibly a transport. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 you have any, uh, I, I don't I don't understand how AI would accelerate a fast free transport, but um, I mean, there's a lot of use of AI in radar, but I see it more at the back end processing. After you have radar detections, then you can do segmentation and all semantic analysis. What are we really seeing in these radar images? But Replace an FFT. I don't know. I, I have not heard of it. Heard it yeah. And the second thing is that you were talking about the uh, static Yes, I guess. So, what would be the motivation in the near future for the static? Well, this is a by static measurement for position. Yeah. yeah, but you can also have two base stations, right? Yeah. One base station is sending a signal, the other base is picking it up, and then they try to map something in the tire. No, I think here, here in this context, by stepping there's a transmitting base station, a receiving base station, or a user. And I'd say it's two base, the receiving base station is trying to then map the environment from the signal received from the transmitting base station. But then we don't intend to have any possible detection. I don't know. Okay. I, I should think about it. I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah, but you need to know something. I mean, typically in positioning, it's something you, you need to know what is transmitted, right? So purely passive would not very obvious that how you would use this for positioning. So I I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Maybe one more question. Yes. The last one. Quick one. 
for our time. So you mentioned the thing in the end, maybe not the best choice for what it be the set implementation that I understand that everybody is happy about. So if you're going to pick one better way for and say bet some or some money on it to be chosen for, which one would you better go? Do you have to spread on the end? Oh, really? Okay. If I have to choose right now and I, you know, to put money on the table, I would yeah. bet on the FT spread up. Yeah, yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe not a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Thanks. And that's a good one. Thank you. Let's thank Frank again. Thank you. Yeah.